just like requests like, Hey Jamie, uh, pull it up on the whatever, like go get me a cup of coffee. Like yeah. you need one, you need one of those. He's the highest tech version of a gopher. You know what a gopher is? You tell somebody to go for something, like, <laughs> go for a coffee, go, you know, they get you your shit, right? They're the, the temps. Yeah. yeah. He's, he's the highest tech version of that. Cause he's like a, a qualified sound engineer who basically just gets to be like, Hey Jamie, pull that shit up about a naked gorilla. The one without the hair. And, yeah, uh, he's like a, a real life Siri. <laughs> that's exactly it. I made a meme about that back in the day. You know that? Uh, For real? Yeah, I had a picture what? of Joe Rogan. What happened to you, memes? Yeah, I uh, I made a picture of him holding an iPhone, talking about the new um, iPhone app, and it wasn't Siri. It was Jamie with an I. So I had him going beep. Jamie, pull that shit up. All right. Uh, well, let's let's get transitioned here cool i think we are live kicking on episode number nine of you me and us <coughs> welcome all the peoples we have got our friendliest new yorkiest person we've had yet in quinn uh he's known as pizza jitsu online henzo gracie black belt recent henzo gracie black belt congratulations quinn thanks drew yeah, uh, how does it feel to not only get your black belt in one of the savagest pools, maybe on the East Coast, but also from the OG himself? I saw Henzo give it to you. Uh, yeah, man. You know what's funny is, like, I feel like how tall you are depends on who you're standing next to. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it feels like. So, on the one hand, like, I, dude, I was a brown belt for six years. Yeah, you, know you had that perennial brown belt. That journeyman yes. brown belt. Six years. So I was like, I I feel like I was a brown belt. Going from brown to black took longer than from Gordon to go from white to black. Yeah, it probably did, <laughs> like, eh? <laughs> so, I mean, on the one hand, I'm like, I was kind of over it. I, I wasn't too into getting a black belt or whatever. Um, the only thing that really annoyed me is when a student would come up and be like, he'd be like, have you ever tapped out a black belt or something like it, like it's some <laughs> mystical thing. Yeah. 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 Like I'm, I'm doing it every day. And then on the other hand, now I'm going into the gym and I'm training with people who are brown belts, like, uh, Oliver Taza. Oh or, yeah. Uh, yeah. Ethan, like even like Nikki, this fucking 16 year old kid, like how am I supposed to call myself a black belt <laughs> after training with these guys? Yeah. I don't for know. Real. It's mixed feelings. That's, um, a bit of a different dimension when it comes to BJJ ranks, you know, like Taza, Nikki, Gordon, all those guys were basically sandbagging brown belt at blue belt. So like, what, what, there was never a point when the people that were contemporary to their belts were like, yeah, I'm this guy. I'm just like this guy. That never happened. <laughs> yeah. There's no way that I was going to, I'm, I'm like walking up to Danaher and I'm like, where's my fucking belt, bro? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was ready to wait another four years. Damn. That's, that's sad. Although like you were saying, like you were at it for so long that how long can you sit on the edge of something and not get bored? At, you know, it's not that interesting anymore. You know, that transition, like people are like, Oh, you're almost at a black belt. I was like, yeah, I've been almost at a black belt for uh, what, where are we going on? Six years. Yeah. I just don't, I don't even know what it means anymore. Mm. Like if someone asked me, like if they're thinking about doing jujitsu or something and they're like a black belt. What is it? I have no fucking idea. I have, yeah. I have so many more questions than answers than when I started. Yeah. You know, I always say, um, the difference between one belt going to the next belt, literally the only thing that changes from the moment before to the moment after is one person's opinion. That's the guy promoting you. That's it. Like your jujitsu hadn't changed. So it's, it's that moment in time where things change, like, uh, not realistically, but kind of like ethereally. <laughs> it's a birthday party. Yeah. It's a good way to put it. That's what it is. It's a shorter way to put it. It's, it's too don't short. Don't you train with Danaher? Why was that so short? What's up? That explanation. <clears throat> it, it was one sentence and like, what? Three words. It's a very short for a Danaher student. Uh, should I be writing like very long winded Instagram posts about it? Oh uh, yes, I think you should. Yo, speaking of Instagram and John, you know who's my number one right now on Instagram? This guy's the fucking world champion. What? 
Have you ever seen Don Janaher's post oh, on Instagram? Oh, yes. I not only follow him, but follow him with Glee. <laughs> who is that? Do you, do you know who that is? Is that someone in know. the gym? You ever identify this guy's identity? <laughs> like, get him to sign my body so I can tattoo it on me. Yeah, he's a hero. He's the hero the internet needs. If people, if you don't follow John, no, Don Jonaher. Okay, so they're they're mixing his name up. It's it's a joke, but the joke is actually in the pictures. He does superb Photoshop memeing. Okay, these are excellent edits of the most hilarious '80s quality versions of like super sexy John Danaher, and he's done one with Gordon Ryan as well. And it's like everything that you ever loved from the '80s put into these characters from the DDS. Yeah, it's like Miami Vice type shit. Totally. Totally. Yeah, I was never, I was born in the 80s. I think you were too. So it, I kind of like, I didn't appreciate it until I was past it, but I kind of appreciate it now retrospectively. And there's nothing that isn't beautiful about those pictures they do. Yeah, actually, I had a, um, I had a Danaher spoof account, but I just don't have the time to dedicate to it. So if anyone wants to steal my idea, it's Brazilian John Danaher. Oh, man. There's a lot of potential there. Hmm. What you do is you take the pictures and you Photoshop them so he has brown skin and brown eyes. <laughs> it sounds like a, yeah. a Panato's alley. <laughs> and the uh, username is Joao Danaher. <laughs> I don't know. I think you can have a lot of fun with that. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody who can uh, type it long-winded but broken English. That would be funny. Do you think you're the king of the Instagram meme accounts for jiu-jitsu right now? I mean, depends how you rate that. I definitely, I think I'm leading the pack as far as follows at the moment. Um, though that could change any time. Accounts are dropping like flies right now. Um, oh, yeah. People are getting like deleted and shut down yeah, and shit. Yeah, just spontaneously deleted. They're not getting any warning or um, really any explanation. Like the biggest one that went down recently was as shopped as it gets. He was at 142,000 followers and just, he, he logged into Instagram. It's, it logged him out of his account and said that there was a, um, uh, copyright violation or something like that completely. Uh, Whoa. yeah, it didn't give any specification, no way to, uh, to appeal it, you know, like trying to get a hold of Instagrams, like screaming into a vacuum. It doesn't go anywhere and nobody answers. So he's just started a new account. I think he's already up to like thirteen or 14,000 people in two days, but that's still a long drop from where he, he was. Yeah. And, and for what? Like, it's not like we're trying to go out there and break user agreements. If, if there was some obvious thing that people are doing that they could stop, I'm sure they'd love to. Yeah, or, I mean, on my end, what I'm seeing happening is maybe I'll just start reporting all the accounts that have more followers than me so I can become number one. <laughs> you know what's funny? Funny but not funny is once um, as shopped got got axed, they got Thanos, the, the finger snapped and they disappeared. Um, yeah. Before they got their second account up, and this was like within a half an hour, so there was a brief window that they didn't exist. Somebody else jumped on and started an as shopped as it gets meme page. Yeah, so it was Whoa. an imposter. And, and he got a bunch of us, a bunch of us other meme guys to start promoting him saying that I'm back, you know, can you help promote my new page? And a bunch of us did and got him a couple thousand followers in like a couple hours. And then it turns out that the, the real ed shop comes back and he's like, bitch, that ain't me. <laughs> I was, yeah. And now, now this guy's still out there. There's still an account that, get this, he's been amending his page to look more and more like the original guys. Like he had some old memes that he deleted that obviously were um were not as shops so he, he got that fixed he started off by saying on his bio deleted at 120k but then the real guy came back and said deleted at 142k which was the accurate number and then buddy changed his number to match that and now he's literally taking picture for picture all the ones that that the original account posts and posted on his like it's 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 madness it's a total doppelganger Damn, dude. Yo, what if someone did that to me in real life? <laughs> yeah. like, the, the body snatchers? Is that what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, like they'd be out teaching my jiu-jitsu classes and getting their ass kicked by Taza and shit. <laughs> it, it's like he was wearing a Quinn suit.
That that would be uh, some interesting shit. I wonder if they would just go right back to doing what they were doing. Who the Instagram guy or the guy the the Taz's skin skin suit guy? Oh, whatever. Pick one. No. Yeah. Well, this is the thing: is I uh, was chirping at this dude, the imposter, on uh, private messages, being like, "Dude, stop it! Like, we know that you aren't the right, the real one. Like, what yeah, are you send doing him, this sending him dick pics and shit." Well, not quite yet, but <laughs> um, he'd probably like it. I don't know. Dude, you, I, got, you have to harass first. You got to harass quick. You have to harass heavy when it comes to those situations. These are the things I need to learn from a savvy New Yorker. Us Canadians don't have that mentality. Um, anyways, I was chirping at him to, to basically fuck off. And he was saying that he it's just a, a joke for him. He, he's not really taking it seriously. He already has another page. So this is just some other meme account that's just fucking with this guy. You know what's funny is uh, I just remember this now, like four years ago, three or four years ago, someone started a Twitter account for Eddie Cummings. Oh, really? But it it wasn't him though. Like he didn't, he wasn't on Twitter. So this guy started the account. He got on there like first and I think he got like 5,000 followers. Wow. It's actually doing a service. Yeah. And he was going on, people would like tweet at him and he would respond like <laughs> as Eddie. It was, it was creepy. It was fucking creepy, man. Yeah. Those are the type of guys you need to find in real life and make sure that they don't have like a, um, uh, a temple to Eddie made in their basement with like love chains and whips, you know? Oh, uh, Eddie might be into that. Oh, really? Well, no judging. <laughs> yeah. And yo, and he had to uh, amend the account and change the bio into saying that it was quote role play. Role play. Okay. Yeah. So is that less creepy? It doesn't sound less creepy oh. to me. <laughs> oh, it doesn't make anything better. Hey, guy, That's I don't gorgeous. know. I'm role playing you, IRL. <laughs> Not creepy. Yeah, dude, it was really weird because um, it, the, the stuff that he would respond to, I remember looking at it just like once. It would be like really mundane shit. It'd be like, "What flavor of Doritos do you like, Eddie?" And he would like the fake Eddie would respond. <laughs> that, well, I mean, that probably speaks to how boring this guy's life was. Before he was fake Eddie, you know, if, if answering Dorito quizzes is like the highlight of his day. What's your favorite Doritos flavor? Oh, I was hoping you'd ask. <laughs> you know, it's not my favorite Doritos flavor. These new fucking Jurassic ones. You, have you had the Jurassic Park ones? No. Not good. Would not recommend one of 10. It's like they um, made it out of that purple tortilla mix or whatever. So it's like kind of blacky, dark purple. Um, to look like Velociraptor skin or something. Oh, yeah. You, you don't like things that are blacky, huh? That's what I was saying. I'm getting to that. Um, but the flavor is like, I don't know, it's some strange barbecue flavor that was just god-awful. I don't know. So that doesn't really answer your question, but it definitely avoids it. I don't know. I'm just – it's like a weird kind of masturbation because right now I'm actually on a ketogenic diet. Oh, so I, I can't eat anything good. So it's food porn by proxy. I have to lose all this weight. Dude, check this out. So I'm supposed to go to Costa Rica and do an eight-man EBI rules fucking invitational tournament or something. Oh, yeah. What's this for? It's, I don't know. To win money, I guess. <laughs> no, I mean, like, what's the promotion? <laughs> what's the, uh, oh, it's called uh, Porta Vida Invitational. Okay. And... Uh, like one of the competitors, it's supposed to be a 195 pound weight class. One yeah. of the competitors was like, oh yeah, you know what? I don't want to uh, cut weight. So now it's open weight. Oh, and, come on. And then two days later, I have a fight to win match, which is supposed to be at 185 pounds. So there's like a 195 pound tournament is now open weight. Yeah. And then I have to weigh 185 two days later. So that's no bueno. No, it's not. I don't know if that's what they say in Costa Rica, but <laughs> I don't know. There might be a dialectal change, but here's the thing. Like you're uh, one of these nasty soulless ankle biters anyways, right? Do you really care about the rest of the human mass above the ankle? Well, jiu-jitsu is about efficiency and I prefer to do as little work as possible. That's right. People say lazy. Efficient is the word. Also lazy, but efficient. <laughs> Try saying that when someone's waking you up from a nap. Yeah, yeah. I'm being efficient. <laughs> so you, um, 
Are you diving into the uh, invitational competition scene? Is this like your goal for now? I guess so. It's it's a little weird, you know. The pro, the pro stuff, it can be challenging to get matches. Like, okay. have, have I messaged you about John Calistine? Like, he's one yeah. of the dudes that's really struggling to find anyone who's willing to fight him. I know. I've been trying to uh, stoke some fires online for him because he's the type of guy that needs a match. You know what I mean? Because his jiu-jitsu is beautiful, it's deadly, and people yeah. need to see it. But the problem is people know that. I've been saying this on at least a couple other podcasts so far, that he he went the wrong way. He started by getting all the skill and none of the notoriety. And now nobody yeah. wants to fight him because of all the skill, but they, they can duck him because he doesn't have the notoriety. Yeah. I mean, that's... Uh... I was actually worried before EBI that he would just like never be able to get matches ever. And then he got on EBI, he won, still has that fucking problem. Yeah, and I'm in like, I'm in like maybe not as bad of a situation because I'm not as skillful. And I have like, I actually have more Instagram followers than this guy. <laughs> Man, that's crazy. <laughs> it's the memes. I'm telling you, they, people love the memes. Dude. If you had told someone in high school 10 years ago that the key to their career would be having better memes than the next person, they would laugh at you. Yeah. Um, it's a different thing. Like it's so deep in the zeitgeist of modern humanity nowadays that like, it's not just in our niche. It's in every niche. You know, you can find a meme account for everything and they're big. Yeah. It's because it is the most accessible form of, of comedy and it's free. You know what I mean? Like you don't have to buy a ticket to it. You just click follow and then you got free content streaming into your phone from 30 different meme pages if you want, you know? Yeah. And it's like instant gratification. It's like eating a potato chip. Like you get like one and you're like, okay, how about a hundred more? Yeah. That was good. <laughs> oh, that was good. And then you notice that you weigh 400 pounds because you're on Instagram all day. That was a... Uh sad dark analogy but i think it's accurate honestly man i think i'm just going to constantly keep circling back to food <laughs> you food, are I don't know um, food is my favorite drug man well that's good because there's worse drugs out there i'm just saying there's better ones too though that's true it's true i don't know i'd, I'd take food laced with drugs how about that why not both <laughs> edibles <laughs> edibles yeah there you yeah. go I have a story for you. So okay. I worked I worked for Naga. Did you know that? I did not know that. Are you yeah, right? I work for Naga. There's a Naga in Hawaii. Ooh. So I go and uh, I work that one. Oof. Yeah, I'm I agree. shouldn't tell this story because now I've Im implicated my employer. But someone I know, listen, they took a 500 milligram brownie edible on the plane ride back from Hawaii. 500 mils is a lot of mils. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like, <laughs> 490 more than someone needs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like you're, you're going Super Saiyan 5. So that's so, a long flight too. Dude, it's like 11 hours back to the East Coast <laughs> or something like that. Eight hours. It was 100 hours. Yeah. On a 500 milligram brownie, it's 100. It's days. It's like a month, man. You're trapped in there. So yeah. I bet you the, the flights got a little wild at, at one point. Was he spooking out? I mean, well, what happens to you at that point? is uh, you visualize your death over and over again, violently, like like the fucking airplane getting ripped open and like getting sucked down to the void and shit. I like how this type of experience is considered recreational. <laughs> I could play video games or I could imagine my horrible, gruesome death over and over without end. And uh, yeah, hook me up with that one. Hey man, people pay money to go see scary movies. Sure, but they don't think that they're actually dying, do they? Yeah, I but a good, one, a good one, it tricks you into thinking that something bad's really happening. Okay, so ooh, so I guess the, the next life hack would be doing the edibles at a scary movie. All right, let's cut this conversation. <laughs> it's getting a little yeah, too personal. Podcast over. <laughs> yeah, so what do you do for Naga then? Are you, are you refing or are you helping with the production side? I guess both, honestly, in that... For that one, you wear a lot of hats. Like, I'm a, I guess I'm a setup lead and like a teardown lead. So I arrive like half a day early or whatever. You yeah. set up the tournament. Then uh, you spend like 14 hours refereeing the next day. Ugh. 
Yeah, I did a similar thing with Five Grappling for 2013, 2014. I was at all their events doing uh, the front end management as well as set up teardown and the whole thing. So I kind of understand what you're talking about. Did you? How long is that day with you referee that tournament? I didn't ref. I was oh. uh, I was running the front end, so uh, bringing people in, spectators, getting uh, the uh, athletes checked in, as well as merchandise, that whole thing, just managing the whole thing. Have you ever refereed before? Oh, yeah. I ref a lot now. I started at Purple Belt. I guess I was a purple then, but like late into my purple, um, I was like a four and a half year purple. So that was most of my jujitsu before I got to Brown. <laughs> and, um, for the last two years I got into it at least like I, I'd say heavily, but that just means that I do them all around Alberta, which is where I'm from. And it's, it's an okay scene, but it's not like a big scene. So I would do maybe ref six to 10 tournaments a, a year. And I've kind of kept up that pace. I've just learned so much about the Alberta jiu-jitsu scene. Yeah. It's here. It's, uh, I don't know if you'd travel from New York for it. Although, coincidentally, I uh, run my own tournaments up here, and I had Gary Tonin up for a super fight back in 2015. So, Damn, who did he have a match against? Um, his name is Matt Bagshaw. He's a, a local leg lock aficionado. So he was the guy that nobody could beat as far as Nogi up here. And Gary pretty much toyed with him for about seven minutes before tapping him with a, like the, um, the Tony Montana double heel hook finish. For real? For real. Yeah. Yeah. At the I end, think... at the end, like as he's going for the finish, Matt's like just threw up his hands and tapped. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> fuck it. Yeah, exactly. And then Gary went on to actually go into the advanced division and nuke everybody there too. He took literally every accolade I've ever produced away from one tournament. He took like two belts, at least one medal, I want to say two medals, and a like a buckle that you get for submitting all of your opponents in a division. Yeah, took out the kids' division. Yeah, <laughs> he was blinged up. I mean, those kids, uh, they were game, but uh, definitely Tiny a couple of them were heels. still limping. Tiny heels, hard to hook. <laughs> That's right. Very bendy. You'd be surprised how far they twist. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Do you have any, you have any like, takeaways from refereeing? I actually find it, like... It's like, you know, it's frustrating, but it's a little bit like spiritual almost. Man, this could be a whole podcast because refereeing, it's so its own thing. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you think you understand what it is from a competitor standpoint. You think you understand what it is from a coaching standpoint, but till you get in there, you don't know what it is. Like it's very, very different. And um, I always think about these guys. There's always those coaches out there that want to ref the matches for their students you know what I mean like they're telling you how many points you missed and how stupid you are while it's happening yeah. and they're they're almost never the ones getting in there and doing it for good reason because whether they know it or not it's a lot more difficult than it is from the sidelines you know uh, between between just the ring generalship trying to keep people within the the boundaries uh, keeping track of who started what transition where and what it means when they stopped you know it's uh, it's I find I have to like yeah. zone in very, very specifically on each match, which is mentally taxing, as you know. You know, um, some of these days are like you're saying between ten to twelve, fourteen hour days, depending how long the tournament goes, and that's it's a long time to stay focused on anything. Like you see these pictures of refs that look like they're just looking off into the wild blue yonder. Well, they are. <laughs> yeah, thousand yard stare. Yeah, yeah, it gets. To I don't a know point if I can. Uh, I don't know if I can stay focused doing twelve hours of anything. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, Naga, they got uh, a little bit modified rules, hey? Do you prefer that to, do you ref other tournaments as well? Now it's only Naga. I used to do some other ones. Naga's rules are way better mm -hmm. than IBJJF. In what opinion. way? What do you like? They get points for submissions. Okay, this is a hot topic. So how, how much um, subjection is there involved from a ref point of view for what is a, a, a worthy submission of points? There's a lot. There's a lot. That's definitely the downside of it. But like the, the positions score way less, like even amount amount, it would be like two points. A oh, back really? position would be like two points. Cause the whole idea is that you should be using those positions to attack submissions and yeah. you get rewarded for attacking the submissions. Right. So, so it produces like a much more exciting match. Like a, 
a 10 minute long IBJJF match has less action than a four minute long Naga match. For sure. In most cases. So would you say that Naga for that reason would be a better, I guess, feeder for the lower levels to learn how to go towards pro jiu-jitsu? Oh man, pro jiu-jitsu. Well, here's yeah, the thing, like, about, like about, what, what did you, you must've read that post from Gordon Ryan a little while back uh, after ACB about the, the difference between, you know, world champions that are used to competing in amateur events going into the pro field. I didn't read it. Yeah, too long didn't read. It was pretty long. It was like the most John Danaherian post he's ever put up. It was probably like six paragraphs, but um, I didn't know Gordon knew how to read. Yeah, it must have been ghost written. Um, so basically, the premise was these guys that are coming in. He didn't name names, but I mean, you could look at the card and look at all of the world champs that they brought over, like IBJJF Mundial champs um, and and perennial winners. Uh, he's saying that they are used to going to tournaments being IBJJF and training for these tournaments to win by advantage because it doesn't matter to the promoter of the event whether they win or how they win. You know, it just matters that they win. Whereas it's completely opposite when you go into a professional venue when you're being paid to entertain people and people are paying money to buy pay-per-views and to show up live and buy tickets to watch an event. You know, it needs to have some action, needs to have some drama. And he's like, these people need to understand that your promoter who's paying you top dollar to fly you around the world to bring you to these venues needs to get some payback for it. Oh yeah, man. I mean, that's like a, that's a classic, uh, for any professional sport that seems to be like kind of the classic battle, which is on the one hand, you're an entertainer. And on the other hand, you're an athlete. And you know, for most of the guys, I, I don't know that many pro guys who are that interested in um, creating an exciting match. They mostly want to win. You see it in the UFC. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, and in most cases, honestly, if you're creating exciting matches, but you don't win, you really don't, you're not getting paid back for it. It's well, the guys who win that. There's examples win. you could see on both sides of that argument. Like look at Chris Lieben. Like he was always fun to watch. Was he ever the guy that's like, yeah, he's definitely going to be the champ. You know, was he ever in like the top five of any division? True. There's yeah, people out there that have styles. And this is the thing, like sometimes you can't cater your style to be exciting, but you could at least take a risk here and there to make a 15 minute battle interesting instead of like one grip fighting for that one advantage the whole time. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm definitely not down to watch it. Well, that's just it. Oh. And the people who are down to watch it are the ones paying for it. I mean essentially i'm pretty sure that the acb guys just put the bill and they're trying to like build their promotion to the point that it carries itself but um that's not going to help when they don't have or when they bring over people that have name value that don't give it that type of shock value in real life uh, i mean the, the best way to do it i'm kind of going off on a little bit of a tangent here but the best way to do it is just to make why don't we just make rules that create exciting matches because the athletes are always going to be the, we have to obey the rules. And I think that the athletes are almost always 90% of the time with very few exceptions. They're going to look to win first and put on a show second. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, I know Eddie Bravo got on, uh, I think it was Instagram after the ACB thing because the promoter of ACB went out there publicly saying he was super disappointed and he really needs more excitement from these talents or he's not going to bring them back. Um, and Eddie said, you're welcome to use our rules. They work very well for us for this reason. And we'd be happy to help you out if, if you're looking to change your rule set to make for more exciting matches. So yeah, same like thing. the stalling calls in jujitsu are so lax. Watch a freestyle wrestling match. Mm -hmm. The guys will be going at it and there's going to be a 10 second break. And oh, I lost you for a sec here. Quinn, the connection's kicking out. Are you back? Yeah, I'm back. Okay, I lost you for a couple seconds. Keep going. You were talking about um, ACB and uh, EBI. No, it's good that uh, I faded out there. I got really angry, and I started shouting racial slurs. Okay. Well, damn, I'm sad I missed that. 
Yeah. Okay. So I'm just happy that I didn't make it online. Okay. Now, uh, listen, man. I mean, look, watch freestyle wrestling. Right. That, I think that's a really good example of something where they they force the athletes to fight. Like the the periods have changed, but they used to be like two minute periods, and right. more would happen in thirty seconds in a freestyle wrestling match than would happen in a ten minute long jiu jitsu match. Mm -hmm. I know that um, I was saying I was working with Five for a year, year and a half. That was one of their things: is they had all of the matches from white belt to black belt six minutes, and they said that especially at the black belt level where they were more used to getting ten plus minutes, depending what venue they're fighting at, six minutes is actually a short time for them to work for the same game to work, right? So it, it progresses faster. Uh, I don't know if time limit is is the best way to do it because. There's a, I feel like there's a relationship between like someone being up on points and there being a relatively short amount of time left where they're now they're like, there's less incentive for them to take risks. Mm. You know, like it, let's say we're in a 10 minute long black belt match. There are three minutes left and I'm up by two points. Like, you know, that that person isn't going to be taking any risks. They're not going to take anything that's not given to them. They're just defending and riding out the clock. But it's incumbent on the guy behind to take the risks at that point. Is it not? Yeah. Yeah. It's always true. But I mean, th like that time is going to, that's halfway through a six minute match. It's 70% through a 10 minute long match. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. There's a, there's a, a certain amount of, of dead time that you're almost guaranteeing. Hey, I know, um, like you were saying with wrestling, they have passivity rules, right? Like you were saying, there's less stalling. So this is something that might play well into pro BJJ for that reason. So there's less you know, you're saying like BJJ is lazy. No, let's make it more efficient, you know, time-wise too. Yeah. Like, let me do something else with my night instead of just watching ACB. Yeah. <laughs> that was a long, long, I mean, it was a, a strange time zone to begin with for most people, but it was a long, long ass event. Yeah. Like I want to be able to watch you get to, but I also want to be able to go see Deadpool too with my girl. That's, that's a tough tr struggle. It's a struggle we all feel. Jiu-Jitsu life balance. <laughs> so, um, you, I don't know if you're doing it as much anymore, but I remember when I first got into Pizza Jitsu online, you were making some of the best short BJJ parody videos I think that Instagram has ever seen. So whatever happened to that, Quinn? Uh, I have the worst excuse for it pretty much ever which is I used to have a really convenient time slot right after I taught like a, like a Monday night jujitsu class or something mm -hmm. where the mats would be clear. There wouldn't be any sound. I would be able to like grab a couple students and then beat them up with a piece of pizza in my hand. Oh, uh, and now it's like, there's like a Muay Thai class afterwards. So if I want to shoot a video, I have to like ask people to come in early or come in on like a Saturday or something. And as you can see, I'm not doing that. <laughs> Okay, so it's a um, a life change thing. That's too bad because they were really good videos. Like I, I think I, I won't be stepping out on too much of a limb to say they're the best. Uh, yeah, they're definitely the best. I'm gonna quote you on that. Okay, you heard it first. Here, put it on your uh, self written novel. BJ or because Jitsu dot dot the best videos. Yeah, I mean it's an underexplored niche. The combination of pizza and jiu jitsu. <laughs> For, for obvious reasons, Mr. Keto Food Porn. Let's not talk about that. That makes me a total poser because I can't really eat like a, <laughs> a true pizza crust right now. Is there a keto pizza out there? Yeah, some people do it with like cauliflower crust or like oh. almond, almond flour and weird shit like that. That's just, it reeks of sadness. It's like if I can't have a pizza crust, I'll have a salad that's also a pizza crust. Yeah, I thought a long silence after that comment would be probably the most appropriate response. I could feel your soul dwindling and being smothered by thoughts of pizza. Who's your inspiration to get that haircut? This one is just a, it's another lazy thing. I think jujitsu just breeds laziness into me. Um, I started, I think it I'm was probably, mats, man. yeah, it was, I was never very good at having a cool haircut. So I wanted to have a cool haircut at one point, and at that particular point in time, the cool guy haircut was Macklemore. 
So I think everybody who wanted to be like that, that hairstyle, before it turned into now you're a Nazi for having it, um, I kind of, I hipstered my way into that one. And again, I'm just lazy. I don't change it. Oh, you're a Nazi now? That's edgy, man. Yeah, no. No, not one of those. We don't have those in Canada. Oh, come on, man. No, they're all very, um, very lefty up here. Have you seen our prime minister? Trudeau, right? Mm -hmm. How yeah. do the ladies like the haircut? Uh, well, the lady likes it fine. I've been married for about 14 years, so I don't know what the other Damn. ladies are saying. 14 years? Yeah. How old are you? I am 34. I got, no, wow. 35. I can't even remember. So it's, uh, I was 21. Damn. You look like yeah. you're, uh, you're 35 going on 19. <laughs> That's because I shaved the beard. All my other podcasts, I had the beard going. Again, laziness. I just decided not to shave. And uh, the other day, I was like, I'm going to shave my beard. And then I forgot after I shaved. I'm like, I look like a baby. Yeah, man, I had the same struggle. I grow the beard out. People think I'm like 40. I shave the beard. I look like I have a baby face, you know? Yeah. So that's why you're keeping like the uh, Gangs of New York mustache going on? Yeah, well, I do the mustache because it keeps children away from me. <laughs> Definitely keeps their parents keeping them away from you, hey? You don't teach yeah, kids absolutely. class, I hope. <laughs> They're trouble, man. The kids are trouble in this city. <laughs> so what inspired you for the mustache, for real? That's a bold move uh, these days. Like I said, man, it keeps children away from me, and it attracts the wrong kind of girls. So I feel like that's a win-win. You're going for the daddy issues, are you? Yeah, that's what you want to hit. Okay, is this uh, Danaher speaking through you? Um, can you imagine Danaher with a mustache? I'm imagining it right now, and I might Photoshop one afterwards. Dude, a big fucking bushy ass one. Yeah, wait, do one with John with a like a big curly uh, old timey mustache, and he's teaching like catch wrestling with his like John Danaherisms. There we go. It would have to be black and white, so it looks old timey. Absolutely, and he's got like a cape on and shit. Am I or the whatever only one? catch wrestlers wear? Am I the only one that can't decide whether he's a superhero or a supervillain? Well, yeah, you're the only one who can't decide because everyone knows he's a supervillain. Okay. Okay, because he seems like, I don't know, he's got the intellect to be either. And he might be playing one to, to false flag the other. I, I can't tell. He's too many layers deep. Okay, intellect, check. Okay, supervillain with intellect, Lex Luthor, right? Is that the guy well, from you're Superman? Just, yeah, you're just thinking because of the baldness. Uh, it might be a false equivalency. Yeah. It helps. It does help in bald guys, evil? Well, think about it, man. It's kind of like fucked up. You think about Superman. Superman is from another planet. He's literally a different race who has huge advantages over any human. Like, we, can, we would never be able to be him. But Lex only has his intellect. And he has to try to beat a super fucking species using only his mind. This lends some credence to the age old question is the, the Batman versus Superman thing. Cause I always thought that was just so ridiculous. Like there's no way Batman can beat Superman, but he's basically the same thing. He's, he's got money and smarts, you know, and Lex has money and smarts. So I guess if Lex can do it, you know, he's been making a stab at it for a while. Yeah. Like if one of them was the jujitsu guy, Lex or Superman, who would it be? Yeah, I guess so, hey? Although I hear that uh, Superman actor does jujitsu. I've seen him with a white belt. I think that John might be able to take him. He should just be doing steroids and bicep curls. Well, he might be doing that too. I mean, he's an actor. Oh, shit. <laughs> Here, okay, here's a question for you. What's up? Um, in your opinion... Outside of the realm of professional jiu-jitsu or even like meaningful amateur jiu-jitsu. So I'm talking like titles that mean something. What is your thought on whether people should or should not use steroids for training? Steroids for training. Because um, it's hmm. very open in the fitness world, you know. It's just considered like something you do. I don't know about something you do because apparently, apparently there's some kind of help for us which in many cases I've heard or overblown. I'm no expert, but I think it's, if someone's like, they're honest about it and they're doing something like super fights and they're open about it, it's not like a dirty secret. Like I just, I feel like 
being untruthful is kind of the the biggest ethical problem with that. That's interesting. Um, so if there was somebody that looked like Jeff Monson, but when he was like 16, he looked like me, um, like clearly is on some sort of extra extra. Um, and he says, yeah, of course I'm on roids. I got good shit. You want some to, you know, yeah. to the interviewers, what do people say at that point? Either, I mean, if he's doing fight super fights, anyone who accepts a super fight with someone like that, they know what they're getting into. When we start getting into tournaments, it gets more complicated. Like people aren't able to like give a uh, consent, so to speak, as to fighting in something that's dirty. Hmm. Interesting. And to, and to be honest, what's going on now, like IBJJF, they say that they test, like what's their testing policy like? <sighs> They test their black belts and only a few of them. Okay, when? Uh, generally for the big four. So we're talking pans, worlds, Brazilieros, Europeans, I think is how it goes. But okay. um, is, it, is it random? Are they showing up places and testing people? Or are they showing I, up on people's doorsteps? I don't think that Gabby Garcia has been tested. I'll put it that way. Dude, can you imagine what would come up if you fucking tested her? I am not a scientist, but I'm sure there would be a lot of interesting chemicals. <laughs> Think about it like this. If you, me, and Gabby Garcia were locked in a room and only the two of us or Gabby Garcia were allowed out. Think it's like the Thunderdome. <laughs> yeah. Well they've already What would happen? What would happen to us? They've already run that test with several Japanese grandmas, and none of them are faring very well. <laughs> Yo, have you seen these Rin Nakai stories that I've been posting lately? No, tell me about them. Um, ooh, Rin Nikai, you never heard of Rin Nakai? No, I don't think I have. No, you haven't. And neither had I until like a week ago. And I'm blown away that it isn't like common knowledge. Like okay. here's your blue belt. Look at all these pictures of Rin Nakai. Huh. So she's a Japanese MMA fighter. Okay. Judo black belt. Okay former uh gymnast or something but she's like fucking jacked man like she's like a smaller japanese gabby garcia basically no way um and this is what makes it really interesting is like when she does weigh-ins and shit she weighs in in like a full like a, like a bondage outfit what how do i not know yeah. about this but on top of that she doesn't look like super tough or something like gabby garcia looks like I would never fuck with her in a dark alleyway. Of like, course. give me Brock Lesnar before you give me Gabby Garcia. I think that they're the same person, just different genders. I've never seen him in the same room. <laughs> oh, interesting. <laughs> Can you imagine what their children would look like? Oh, man. If they reproduced? It'd be a different species, I'm pretty sure. Dude, that kid would be like a trillionaire from taking everyone's lunch money. He'd be robbing the <laughs> teachers. Yeah, for real. Yeah, they they would be signing him on to WWE and UFC before he hit double digits. So check this out. This Rin Nakai chick, mm -hmm. she has like a hundred videos on YouTube that are made by Pancrase. Pancrase is the producer or like the, that's the account that it's running under and okay. stuff. And every single one of them, she's doing some some weird different fetish thing. Really? Like in one, she's in like a bondage outfit and she's just like awkwardly doing bicep curls. <laughs> but she, <laughs> yeah, she, she has this like look on her face. Like, uh, she's like, are you recording? Like, that's the kind of look that she has, like, she has no idea what's going on. Weird. And the next one, she's like stretching. You're like, okay, like I can see that there's like some weird underground fetish thing. Huh. Well, and then you go, you go to another one and she's like, eating at a food court, but like, she's kind of got some cleavage and she's like, Oh, I'm eating naughtily at a food court. <laughs> There's, here's the thing is there are obviously all sorts of niche things going on online, but I want to say that in real life, Japan has some of the weirdest like niche things, period. Like take yeah, for like example, what? just, just look without getting into the sexual shit, which goes deep. Just look at their hardcore music scene. Like, look at what should be like heavy metal uh, or alt metal or, or metal core, whatever you want to call it. And you've got bands like um, Lady Baby. Have you ever heard of Lady Baby? No. Oh, dude. Huge in Japan. And the lead singer of Lady Baby, first of all, the entire band is female except for the lead singer, who is not only male, 
but an enormous male. I mean, like all of the steroids, giant used to be a bodybuilder male who dresses up in drag with full makeup and like sings in a deep burly voice and looks like Sailor Moon. Now I have to go listen to you it? You have to see ba Lady Baby. Yeah, and um, you can find those strangisms in anything you want in Japan. You know, they kind of take it in the weirdest... I mean, look at uh, Japanese game shows. Like, do you see any game shows like that over in the U.S.? Of course you don't. Unfortunately, no. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't want to do it, but... Um, it's, it's built into their culture, I'm pretty sure. To be strange as fuck. Yeah, so this, it, as shocking as this lady sounds, when you say it's a, it's a Japanese fighting superstar, it makes more sense to me. Yeah, like, uh, and she'll, she'll do, it's almost like she can't decide on which niche to pursue, so she just does <laughs> all of them. She's going to scattershot and see what sticks. Yeah, spray and pray, man. <laughs> There's this, um, I don't know if it's Japanese uh, lady, I want to say it's Japanese, who has like this ketchup and mustard thing online. Have you seen this going around on Facebook? I see these videos popping up where she's like in an entire bathtub of mustard or an entire bathtub of ketchup. And she's like laughing and splashing and just drinking it and like dipping giant things of chicken in it and eating it. It's like the weirdest thing, but it's huge like you look at the views on it it's in like the hundreds of millions drew if i got into your like internet search history what kind of fucking shit would i find man nothing weirder than you'd find in in the dds i'm sure yeah that's just a black pit <laughs> yeah i see um like i i know gary a little bit but probably not to that extent but between him and Gordon and some of the other guys, I can kind of catch the flavor for what that gym must be like uh, behind the scenes. Yeah, it's really uh, it's a toxic environment. <laughs> you, um, have you ever scared people away with, with that style of humor there? Uh, absolutely, yeah. Usually people, like for the first four times that they meet me, if they make it that far, they don't even know that I'm fucking around. I think I'm totally serious. Interesting. Maybe we need to do... Um, like a, a live-in reality show with the Death Squad. That would be stopped in the first episode. Well, I'm thinking Netflix. You know, a little less censorship. Maybe HBO. I don't know. We're going to have to look at the budget. Maybe shoot it on an iPhone and see if they like it. <laughs> like, what, what do you think we would find if we just strapped a GoPro on Dan Hurst's <laughs> chest? Oh my god, that would sell faster than his leg locks here as I fucking promise you. <laughs> there would be so many knives. <laughs> yeah, what's with the knives? Is that like a thing or is that just like not not as big as he makes it seem? Oh no, it's it's even bigger than anyone knows. Really? So there would be a, cl a jiu-jitsu class going on at noon on a normal day in New York City, planet Earth. And... John, usually he'll like show stuff and then he sits on the side and he like watches. And like once every two months, somebody comes in with a package. It's for John. You already know what it is. Okay. It's, every package is the same. He opens it up. It's another horrendously sharp knife. And the class will be going. People are getting like judo thrown, like feet away from him and shit. And he'll order someone to go into the office and get a piece of uh, printer paper. And I'll just start slicing it and progressively thinner pieces. So, yeah, definitely super villain. Yeah. It's like once he breaks out the knife, you're like, damn, I better fucking like make sure this technique I'm hitting is perfect because I want to <laughs> piss this guy off. Wow. So conspiracy theory. Um, he gives away a knife to somebody who wins a championship in, underneath him. Is that right? Something like that. Yeah. Um, he's probably killed somebody with that and he's pawning off the uh, murder weapon. That's a really good idea. Is it Don't not? let him hear you say that, man. Well, Girl. yeah, shit. Mm. It might be too close to home. It's something yeah, a like, super villain would do. It would be the Danaher literal death squad at that point. <laughs> That's right. Take it literal. And uh, everybody thinks that they're getting like this this great trophy from their prestigious master when really they're actually becoming the patsy. Yeah. Why does it have blood and hair on it? <laughs> yeah. Don't, don't show it to the cops, but if they ask, it's yours. 
I mean, if you were going to kill someone, you had to. Would you choose a knife or? This goes deep into psychology here because apparently a knife is the most intimate way to kill somebody. I don't know if it's the most, but it is. According to CSI Miami, it's intimate. That sounds romantic. Right? <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Have that in your Tinder profile. Were I to kill you, it'd be with a knife, baby. I get intimate. Can you intimate. imagine the kind of freaks you would attract with that kind of shit? Yeah, you, it might be surprising why people swipe on that. Drew, man, I'm just saying I hope everything works out. But if it doesn't work out between you and the wife, that's going to be your Tinder bio. Okay, well, start one up so uh, you can get me a good name before it's gone. That plus the fucking haircut, you're going to be killing it in Alberta. Yeah. Like I said, everybody's uh, cold here in the winter. They need to snuggle up to survive. I feel like I want to say I know Prince didn't have that haircut, but I feel like you're sort of like a white prince and you keep Prince's vibe going. Okay. Um, so what do I need to do for drugs then? Too soon? <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> Eat pancakes? <laughs> I don't think I could pull off the music, man. Like, that voice is something else. Maybe that's why I'm so white. I don't know. Maybe it's too white to be good at that type of soul. Yo, talk about white. I have, like, I went to, I went on a ferry ride to Governor's Island in New York okay. on Sunday, and I have, like, the perfect, like, the kind of tan that no one wants where it's in the <laughs> shape of a tank top. <laughs> yeah, or sunburn, whatever. Uh -huh. I look like I voted for Trump, basically. Of course. So that's that's your story. That's the white story. I thought there was more coming. No, that's it, man. It's like I'm I'm really embarrassed to take my clothes off in the locker room at this point. Oh, okay. So you, it's um, got that Kentucky burn. Well, people don't realize the kind of oppression that we get from the natural world as white people. Go on. Just wanted to spread, just wanted to spread some uh, awareness about that. Okay, this is your PSA. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's uh, seriously hard being out there with burnt skin. Maybe in Canada you wouldn't know. No, it gets ungodly hot here for about two weeks in the middle of the summer, and then the sun starts going down a little more every day, and you get depressed. It's the way it goes. Cycles of depression and burnt skin and mosquitoes, and then back to snow. Should tell somebody about that. Yeah. Yeah. We get serious mosquitoes up here, man. Like, they are not to be fucked with. Like, there is a thing that happens when mosquitoes get into colonies of mating colonies, and they become what's essentially a vortex tornado of mosquitoes that circle for, like, 40 to 60 feet in the air. Just a solid like column. It is a mosquito orgy, and they just will. A fuck fest. Yeah, and you can drive past fields and watch these like black columns going up, which is mosquitoes. You don't want to be walking through the grass at that point because you're lunch, and they are savage. They just there was this one time, I was out with some friends, uh, shooting guns at his ranch, and I had Pause. a yeah, it's a, it's an Alberta thing. Um, <laughs> And I had a straw hat on to keep the sun off of my white skin. We already covered why. PSA out. Um, but I heard what sounded like a two-stroke, maybe like quad, coming over the hill. And I'm looking around to see who's coming because I don't. I want to make sure I'm not shooting in their direction, right? And I hear this, roo, 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 roo. And it's getting really confusing until I take my hat off to kind of scratch my head and the, the noise gets louder. And I look straight up, and I'm standing directly underneath one of these columns, and it sounds like an engine. There's so much buzzing wings above my head. And I, I, I ran like a little girl. See, that's a better, so, better white guy story. Who's the first person that, there? it's like, you know, the Lewis and Clark in that area, where they're going through, they're like, okay, winter all the time, check. Two weeks of summer, and then you get depressed, check giant columns of fucking mosquitoes that'll eat you alive check let's start a town here yeah they must have been so introverted they're like nobody else is coming here i can be alone i can die alone and i can be happy and live in beaver pelts wow you sold me on that so quick <laughs> <laughs> yeah i bet living in new york you're like people so many people get away from me people a lot of crazy people how many crazy people per capita? More than a regular big city, or is this like a special thing for New York? 
I want to say it's special because I always want to think that New York is number one. Oh, okay. You're one of those. Um, but when I travel, I definitely like every place that I go to, like I, I came back from uh, Europe recently. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, the homeless people here, they're not so bad. <laughs> you know? So the homeless people in New York have a little more crazy in them? Yeah, it's next level shit, man. Hmm. It's next level. It's like to the point where sometimes I'll see one of the, the technical term is EDP, emotionally disturbed person. The police are actually, they're not allowed to use tasers on them because the tasers, they won't let, it's like not enough to put one of them down. Oh God. So yeah, they'll just end up like, they'll keep shocking them until they die or something. So they don't, they don't do it anymore. It sounds like an episode of Underworld. Like you, you need a little more to take out these werewolves. Yeah. I mean, look at it in jujitsu. Like the crazier the person is, the harder it is for the, for you to defeat them. I could see that. I could see that. Interesting. Okay. Is there maybe a set of twins that do the lighter weight classes that, I don't know, what would they be doing if they weren't doing jujitsu? E uh, eating people, probably. <laughs> We're just deep in the conspiracy theories with psychology right now. We wouldn't be talking about the meows. It's probably somebody else, though. Yeah, some of the people that I train with, what would they be doing? They weren't trapped in a basement, segregated from the rest of the world. It's essentially what it is at Henzo's. It's a padded cell. Yeah, where they practice murder and get really yeah, good at it. Let's be honest about what we're doing. Is we're just like simulating killing people inside of a padded cell. In faster, more efficient ways. Yeah. Um, so if we weren't allowed to practice the simulated version, what would these fucking people be doing every day? <laughs> Which leads me back to the knives. Okay, I'm telling you, there's something there. With the knives? Yes. Yes, because he's leading the murderers. He's he's head murderer, right? Simulated, quote unquote. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I guess you have to wonder what's Gordon going to do? Like he beat the no-gi game, right? Mm -hmm. And now he's trying to beat the game in the gi. Right. Is the next thing going to be knives? <laughs> like Like to the death knife fighting? Yeah, dude, he's he's working for a promotion that's in Chechnya right now. You yeah. think it's not illegal in Chechnya to fight to the death with a knife? That's what they do on <laughs> fucking Saturdays, man. Yeah, it's probably under the same promotion. <laughs> Don't mind the stains. <laughs> oh, actually, did you see they do, like, night fights? Oh, yeah. Is that the same guys? I have no idea. They definitely, they definitely drink at the same bar or something. <laughs> Yeah, I saw that going around on Facebook. It was one of these clickbaity things, but I couldn't stop watching because they were pummeling each other. Yeah. Like yeah, this was not just... staged. This was not like your uh, your night show in L.A. What's a night show in L.A.? Uh, what is that uh, that restaurant, the Medieval Times? Medieval where they Times. Have, yeah, they have the night shows, right, where they like fake joust each other and whatever. Not Not the same. No, these guys are like trying to fucking crack the, the chest plate open with a giant mace. Yeah, and like they're allowed to do ground and pound and shit. I saw one where the guy used his metal shields to give the other yeah. guy like brain damage. <laughs> Just like stab, 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 yeah. die, die. <laughs> I shouldn't be laughing because he's probably dead, but it's, it's kind of funny. Well, it's like, dude, you put on armor and you start getting weapons like you accept that you could die. Yeah. Yeah, this you is know? some Game of Thrones shit. You ought to know by now. There was a very hefty waiver you signed. Yeah, he died doing what he loved. <laughs> Being forced to fight for his life. <laughs> yeah. Rest in peace, Red Viper. Is that the guy, Red Viper, who died? I, I think so. Yeah, the Viper. Yeah, I think something like that. That was a sad scene. Spoiler alert if you're like three years behind on Game of Thrones. That should hey, be coming one second. soon. Be right back. Mm -hmm. I think Game of Thrones is starting up again in like... I want to say September. It is July right now. I'm looking forward. I'm looking forward to that next Game of Thrones season. Sorry, a ghost knocked something over in my room. Oh, you get those a lot? Uh, yeah, man. It was probably that, like, uh, it was the medieval time. <laughs> yeah. So, 
what else you got going on now? Like, is everything right now for for you? Is it professional jujitsu? Is that a, that your whole game? Like, you Not just got all, your black man. belt. I just, I just compete because everyone else is doing it, and I'm like, fuck it, I'll go. So I'll try to get some matches. So do you have plans of doing your own gym? Starting like you're running seminars now, right? Are you get putting a tour together? Yeah, um, yeah. Like when I go to Costa Rica, I'm definitely seminars. I just came back from like a European tour. I taught seminars in Germany and uh, in Czech Republic and shit, and it was fucking awesome. Yeah. But competing is cool. I just kind of compete to whatever, test myself, see if I suck at jujitsu. That's a good way to figure that out. Um, find some motivation, and I guess in a sick way, it can be fun sometimes. Mm. And it's like I have students. I run a jujitsu program in Astoria, Queens. I don't own the gym. Maybe one day I'll open a gym, but it's like. When you're opening a gym, it's like you're the guy who's got to fix the pipes and fucking do the paperwork and shit. It's not really glamorous. No. I know. I'm doing that now myself, and the paperwork kills me. Just oh, you opened a gym? Yeah. Yeah, I'm about a month and a half in. and oh, it's, it's just a baby. Yeah. Yeah. I'm new to that field, mm -hmm. but it's equal parts fun and terrible. I'll put it that way. Like, if you can focus on the fun, great, but don't think that the terrible goes away. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's just a lot of non-jujitsu shit that you got to be concerned with. I like running a program. I show up, I teach classes, I leave, I do a little bit of like, someone's not there. I'm like, hey, where the fuck are you? Did you get abducted? Did you get taken? Do I have to call Liam Neeson? <laughs> you know, but otherwise it's mostly just about the jujitsu. Yeah. Um, it's, I think it takes a certain type. Like they say that uh, martial arts gyms are one of the hardest businesses to actually keep afloat that and pizza places. So you're kind of in a dangerous niche yourself, <laughs> but there's, there's, there's so many ways to fail at it. So, um, yeah, we're in the wrong industry, man. We should have started like strip bars or something. Well, here's the thing. Like we're literally teaching people how to save their fucking life when they need it, you know, in the best, most efficient way to do so. And they're yeah. like hundred bucks a month, man. Really? Or like 150 bucks for, for a yeah. seminar to teach me how to save my life. Fuck, man, I'd rather die. Or it's it's not even that. Like, I mean, most people, I don't know if they'll get caught. I don't know how it is in the streets of Alberta. But even here, it's like you're not going to get into too many life or death situations like in New York in the year 2018, unless you okay. live in Brownsville, you know? Um, but it's like, well, what else are you going to fucking do with your time? Like, what are people's hobbies? It's like, you're either going to, like, you make money doing something that, maybe you like maybe you don't and then you blow it on like eating like food or something that somebody else made you post the picture on instagram like you you drink a cocktail that cost 14 dollars. like the, like no one has hobbies you know yeah you're going to hobby shame people from instagram onto jujitsu mats that's okay i'm down with that yeah well it's like at least i try to combine eating with jujitsu hey that's the perfect mix in my opinion you know, we just got to find a way to get some fat asses involved. And it's like, I'll go right to the top, man. <laughs> I will take your spot as number one. There we go. Now we're talking. You don't find too many fat asses in jujitsu after a while, though, because it's kind of a, a problem solver in that way. Like, if you can come to it for the fun and the enjoyment, you kind of just lose weight, period. Oh, no. I was just talking, I was talking about like thick. Like, think about the the kind of girls that have no talent but have, like, 200,000 followers. You know what I'm saying? I hear what you're saying. Squat if I can model. cross all three of those, I got, like, the jujitsu thing. Um, I'm on the food part of Instagram. And then if I can just get the hoe portion checked off, it's like, that's a triple <laughs> threat there that can't be beaten, man. It's true. You know what's funny? I guess it shouldn't be that funny or surprising. But anytime I post a picture of Gordon Ryan's abs, which are like plentiful, he has way too many abs. I haven't counted lately, but it's, it's above 20. He has more than 20 abs. Whenever I post a picture of those, the engagement, whether or not it's funny, is just, it, it skyrockets. Because really? I, I'm sure that half of Instagram is looking at half naked people. That's it. Like, it's, it's kind of like your precursor to porn you can't actually show nudity but you can show everything but you know what i mean so the fittest you are the more you show like you flash an ab or something like that you're gonna bump those numbers you're gonna keep bumping those numbers i'm gonna start cropping my head onto his body you should do it you should do it 
I, it's a shameless play I make every now and again, not the cropping, but uh, just using his his many abs to forward my own goals. <laughs> That's a great insight. Right? That's, great. That's like a weird kind of like uh, prostitution that he doesn't get paid for. He's doing a service. He's the, the hero that the rest of us need. Thanks, Gordon. <laughs> yeah, not even hating. Do but it. yeah, man, I'm mostly, I focus on uh, teaching jiu-jitsu. I compete sometimes. I like to teach the seminars and all that kind of fun stuff. And I work peripherally in the industry as like a, a sponsored athlete or whatever, and also for Naga. So, the, you know, the main thing that I focus on is I think that we suck as a population of jiu-jitsu instructors and that we don't actually study sports science. We've never opened a book or even watched a YouTube video on how people actually learn shit. And we just like, like every jiu-jitsu mm. class everywhere, like I'm sure you can give me the formula. What's the formula for every single jiu-jitsu class at, at every gym? For the adults or for the kids? Adults. Uh, it's warm up technique spar. Yeah. You can go any place on planet earth and it's going to be warm up technique spar. And we talk such a big game about like efficiency and we want to do things the easiest, the most effective way ever. But as an instructor, like it's just like, we never look at ourselves and like, and we don't think what's the easiest and most effective way to teach the most easiest and effective way to beat somebody, you know? Mm. That's inception. I like where you're going with this. So uh, have you delved into these depths yourself? Is this one of your pet projects? Yeah, 100%. I would say I'm like, maybe I'm like a blue belt or purple belt level instructor. But uh, that's also relatively speaking, most of the jujitsu instruction that I see, even if the person is amazing at jujitsu themselves, I would say it's like white belt level instruction. Hmm. So if you were said white belt instructor, not outing myself, partly. Um, <laughs> what would be the number one go-to book that you would want them to start with? A book. Or, hmm. or a resource. Like, where are you finding this information? Is there a, a type of research that they want to look at? Is there an, a researcher that's doing good work? I think, um, I guess maybe my definition, it, it's not the best place to start from some of the things that I said. I think the number one thing the thing that makes jujitsu effective or any combat sport effective is accountability. So like when you're doing jujitsu and you do a move wrong, you get the shit kicked out of you. When you like, you're learning how to box, you do Muay Thai, you get a move wrong, you get your teeth knocked out. Like as a jujitsu instructor, you could be showing a move and you could just butcher it. You could butcher the actual instruction, the way that a class is structured and run. And there isn't much in the way of accountability at the end of it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. like, like, how do we track our, our own performance as instructors? Uh, usually your students' performances, right? Yeah, but it's like when someone comes in off the street, they don't know anything. Okay? They're a blank slate. Um, if you teach them anything terribly, will they get better or will they get worse? Yeah, you're going you're to get better. They'll improve, man. Yeah, they'll still improve just because the level is so low. Right, right. So I would say that's the number one thing would be how can we find a good way to be accountable? And I would say the best way to do that is to try to devise some kind of game or a testing system where whatever you're showing or working on that day, whether it's techniques or drills or whatever it is, strategy that you're talking about, there's some kind of game where you can observe your students play in the beginning of class. And there's some kind of game where you can observe your students play it at the end of class. And you should be able to see a substantial change in most of the students. Hmm. That's a good insight. I like that. Yeah. And I would start with that. And then you'll have a tool to evaluate whatever it is that you learn from any resource. Hmm. How often uh, do you put together like multi-day or multi-week series is, or do you kind of jump around in techniques and let them catch up? Um, for me in particular, and I can't guarantee you that, that this is the best way to do it because um, populations are different from school to school sure. on how often people show up and stuff. But I do a two week long um, rotating schedule where for two weeks, usually it's, we focus on one position. So it's like two weeks, we're going to work guard 
and it's going to be this, it's going to be like spider guard or something. Mm -hmm. So it's like you do spider guard against someone who's on the feet for week one. First day is like, here's two or three moves. The next day is like, here's one or two of the moves I showed yesterday, but here's a, a third or fourth option you haven't seen the next day. And it's like, you're doing, you're constantly reviewing a lot of the most important information, mm -hmm. but you're also adding uh, at the appropriate times new information. Because, I mean, if you can think of, of something that you learned a month ago, and which is really a short period of time in respect to your entire jiu-jitsu career, you probably can't even tell me what moves you were going over. Right. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. Um, I find different answers from different schools, and I'm not sure really what the, the right modality is, because like you're saying, with different... Uh, groups of people, but also just the way that certain groups learn. Like, there's different types of learners out there, you know? There's those that have to feel it kinetically. There's those that can pick it up like a sponge just by listening yeah. to it or watching it one time. And then there's those that have to grind it out. You know, like you're saying, a lot of repetition, it's the same move, but now we're adding one tweak this class, you know? Yeah, I'm one of the ones that has to grind it out. Are you? Maybe that's why you're the sixth uh, year brown. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, man. Hey, I train, I train with some of these guys and I see them like learn a move and then I watch them roll and they're using a move they've never seen before until that day. And they tap out like a black belt or something with it. Mm -hmm. You know, that's like the kind of people that are in the death squad. And I noticed that a lot of like, at least my students, um, they don't tend to be doing that. So they need a little bit of help on my end. Okay. Well, I mean, they say your vibe attracts your tribe. Maybe you're just bringing in grinders. Fuck, man. I got to like <laughs> pretend to be smart or something. <laughs> yeah, I'm the type of guy that, that does pick it up like immediately. Like I have that sponge mind and, a, and an encyclopedia that I can sort of flip through my Rolodex of moves while I'm, while I'm rolling. And I pull, well, off I, strange, yeah, I pull off strange shit in tournament for that reason. I'll be like, oh, I just remembered this move from six years ago. I'm going to try it. Oh, it worked. Cool. Other people, like I've got friends that um, kind of uh, have been with me on the way up. They're a similar rank, and they got to work hard to get good at one move, man. And they'll they'll do it. They'll get there, but they're really focusing. Like it's guillotines this year. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> 2018, the year of the guillotine. <laughs> That's right. I know a guy who did that. I know a brown belt around. He's a black belt now, but he was a brown belt at the time that literally spent a year focusing on guillotines and let me tell you he's got a good guillotine so there's something there yeah i know a guy that did that uh gordon <laughs> yeah he yo if you want a story here's one gordon started going for guillotines one day and one uh day. i he would go for them and then i would pass his guard and then he was like yeah you know what I just want to have like a really strong guillotine that i can tap anyone with and i'm like all right man good luck and then, like, two months later, he's already got some fucking system that's unstoppable. Huh. And, and then, like, eight months later, he wins ADCC finals against, against Keenan. Against Keenan, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't, I'm sure you probably saw that coming, but no, nobody else saw him winning by guillotine in any match. Well, when shit like that happens, I'm honestly, I'm just happy that I'm not the only one who's getting my ass kicked with these moves. <laughs> How long have you been training with Gordon specifically? Gordon. Wow. If we're going to talk about Gordon, Gordon was the kid that Gary Tonin, the blue belt, like teenage 17 year old or something kid, scrawny that Gary Tonin would bring along with him. Um, maybe like four years ago or something Yeah, I, remember, I would, that I would kick the shit out of. I remember following, uh, Gary's basically deridement of his student, Gordon, this guy that has a profile called Gordon Loves Jiu-Jitsu just seems like, yeah. the, like the loser nerd jiu-jitsu geek, right? Gordon loves jiu-jitsu. It's like, you know, and then the Gary would, would make fun of him relentlessly yeah. online, publicly, you know, and that's how I learned who Gordon was. And then every now and again, he'd be like, oh, and he won a tournament. And I'd be like, hmm, interesting. Yeah. And then he'd be like, you know, he's, he's getting better. And he started making fun of him a little less and a little less. And now he's like, yeah, I can't beat this guy anymore. <laughs> Yeah, that's basically that's basically what happened. Every time he would come in, he would have like a new stupid tattoo. <laughs> you know, he was just like a scrawny blue belt like teenager, and then like he just trained a million times a day. And then I like 
I wouldn't catch him with stuff anymore. And then like, he would be like a real threat. He'd be like a really hard role. Yeah. People would come in big MMA guys or like really good jujitsu guys would come in and be like, Oh, I need a light round. Let me get like the scrawny spaghetti string kid. How'd that go? And he would start, he would start crushing them. Yeah. You know? And then once he started like getting the better of me, it was like, it never, now he's paid back anytime I've done anything to him, like w- with so much interest. Uh huh. Yeah. It's, it's always, it's, um, it's good and bad. If you're the guy who started ahead of another guy to see them yeah. getting better, you're like, yeah, right on. You're doing good. Wait, slow down. Okay. That's, that's pretty no. good. Just a little too good. Back it off. Holy shit. You're amazing. Fuck off. <laughs> yeah. Chill the fuck out, man. And then he starts like lifting weights with Brazilian fitness models and getting huge. He has like 30 pounds on me right now. It's like the being more technical isn't enough for you. Yeah, no, he's, he's trying to kill the fitness game now. He's got all this um, muscle farm. I don't know what's, what's in that shit, man. It's all the horse meat or something. Yeah. I thought the Canadians were the ones into the horse meat. Can you send some of that shit down to me? No, you got moose. <laughs> <laughs> no, was it, wasn't that, uh, Dude, there was like one of the like the French Canadian guys, Patrick Cote, oh, on yeah, Ultimate yeah. Fighter. Do you remember this? And he was like, "Man, I could really go for some horse meat right now." And everyone That's in the right. house, was like, what the fuck are you talking about? Oh, I forgot about that. Poor old yeah. Patrick. That's a throwback. He was a uh, uh, for us a hobby student. He trained with GSP, and um, which is an interesting connection to Donaher, which. I honestly didn't realize the connection between Faraz and Donaher until years after the George like arc. You know, I was like, he trains with his main coach, coach Faraz, and he also supplements down with his jujitsu coach down in New York with Donaher. Well, actually, Faraz is Donaher's black belt, so it's kind of like the exactly the same tutelage. Um, I'm just this the whole time you were saying that I'm wondering how knives and horse meat is going to play into this connection <laughs> we're getting there hold on <laughs> is that just was that just like an illuminati hint at like the source of the horse meat i don't know um does john cross the border very much this may play into how how much the cops know i can't say can't say uh i do notice that he's doing more seminars lately uh like back in the day i was told by gary when he was up here for that super fight i was like how do I get John Danaher to come for a seminar? Because he's one of those guys that's super interesting. Clearly, he's doing good things with you guys. How do you do it? He's like, he doesn't do seminars. This was in like 2015. And he's like, the only way you're going to get him to do seminars, and I'm not going to say how, but it involved hookers. Um, and I thought, I'm like, okay, well, that's, that's, I guess that's probably not going to happen then. <laughs> but then now, he's oh, not. Why not? Yeah, well, sure. I guess if you really want him, I guess I didn't really want him. Um, oh. If you... Fast forward to, I guess it was 2017, where Danaher hits social media, like a meteor. You know, I, I actually messaged Gary when I saw the, the account go live. I was like, is this a troll or is this real? He's like, no, this is real. I'm like, follow. I got on early. All right. And uh, now not only is he like giving a little uh, sneak peek into his systems, he's actually recording them now and selling them now and doing seminars now. So... It's an it's an interesting change. Is that do you think that is that the reason he went on social media to begin with? Because he's like, all right, now I'm ready to distill this shit. John is an enigma. If you want to ask me what what's the reason that John such and such, mm. I have no fucking idea. And no one does. Yeah, he strikes me as the kind of guy. If you asked him in person, you wouldn't get a straight answer, anyways. Uh yeah. I mean, honestly, uh. I didn't even know he had a phone till like a year ago. <laughs> well, apparently not only does he have a phone, but, but he can uh, write like small novels on it on the way home from, from class. I feel like he writes that shit faster than it takes me to read it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can tell you, I'm not a fast reader and it takes, I got to sit down and like, you know, in a comfy armchair, with the fire crackling and get my favorite uh, cup of something going to enjoy a full down her post, like to really bite into it. It would make a good, like a, 
like one of those coffee table books that like you flip through and it's got all of his posts in there. Yeah, he's got like 800 posts now. That's got to be at least a three volume book novel set. Good opportunity to monetize this. Now we're talking. That's going to be the next move after the videos uh, blow up the internet is we're going to go, we're, we're going retro now. We're getting the Kindle going. He's going to get on the Kindle with the written word. And all he has to do is just transcribe what's already there. Just, just edit it by an editor. I would love to have him uh, do like an audio book of just his <laughs> Instagram. He'd have to read it. <laughs> or if he did just like a special one, like a free content kind of thing where he just talks about knives. You could probably get him on a YouTube channel doing that. Is he going to be on this Because Jitsu podcast? <sighs> I don't know if I'm ready for that one. I got I got prepared for that one. That's not one that I'm just going to bring on. You know what I mean? I don't what are you going to do to prepare? Dude, I feel like I'm preparing right now. There's so much shit I, I didn't know. I, I wasn't prepared for at this point. Like he might just blindside me. There's too much too much enigma. You know what I mean? Yeah, dude. He's going to ask you, what are the four stages of making a knife? <laughs> uh, first, you mine the metal, and then uh, yeah, he's he's the only you guy. You order it on Amazon. Uh, step two. He's the only guy that I've seen make Joe Rogan seem like an idiot at all, at all times. And it wasn't because he was an idiot. It's because the way that he keeps formulating his questions, you don't want to answer wrong. So you just stop answering. <laughs> yeah, he's very Socratic. Yes. It's frustrating to some people. I know there was a lot of people afterwards who were like, he's such an asshole. I'm like, it's a method of teaching. A lot of professors use it. It was the, the way Socrates taught. But it yeah, is frustrating, right? It. Every time I go to his class, I feel more retarded. I bet. Um, I've done a number of Kyotera seminars, and he does a similar thing in that there is, if you ever go to a world champion seminar and they ask you to be the Uki, the demonstration partner, it's an honor. Never, never do that in Kyo seminar. You're going to have your entire personhood, your ego, completely crushed in front of everybody to watch because there's nothing you can do right. You're always going to do it wrong, and he's going to let you know that you're stupid and you should be doing it the other way. And he keeps asking you, why are you doing it this way? You shouldn't do Why would anybody do it that way? Don't do it that way. You do it this No, other hand, other hand. Move your hips. You know, this, it's, it's painful to watch, but he explains afterwards, you know, like I'm very, very particular about details, and I'm not going to let anybody get it wrong. Like, yeah, I get that. And also, I'm never going to be that guy. <laughs> Damn, thanks for the heads up. Yeah. Yeah, like, don't miss a seminar. You'll learn something, but don't be the Uki. <laughs> you're you're going to walk away and, like, start considering your life. Don't be the Uke in a Mario Sperry seminar. Oh, I can imagine. <sighs> There's probably some, like, liability waivers you got to sign just for that. Yeah, and it's like you got to show up with those Brazilian Valley Tudo shorts. <laughs> Is that part, part of the deal? It's, it's fucking man-on-man -man action, man. It's true. People don't pay for anything else. You got to wax your chest or is that not necessary? Your chest isn't already waxed? What are Shit. you doing? Again, not ready for that podcast yet either. This is why I need I'm to sorry, work my way I'm up. I'm sorry I coyoteered you there a little bit. <laughs> that could be a thing. <laughs> and why isn't your chest waxed, my man? <laughs> Everybody wax. You should know this. It's the arch of Schwabi. <laughs> got to be smooth, dude. Yeah, you do. So what is your training schedule now like you say you're on this strict keto diet you've got all of these pro matches coming up are you training more often are you training more careful are there certain people you aren't training with like how does this work for pizza jitsu mr quinn i don't like to train with people that uh i don't recognize because for some reason when people look at me at the hands of gracie academy like if they're visiting they're like oh that guy is a fucking idiot and i can definitely beat him up so they go like a million percent and then I have to like pop their knee with a, a heel hook or something. Okay. So training. Do you good. ever get that? Do you have people come and visit? They're <laughs> like, oh, that's the guy that I can fuck up. I've never heard of him before. I, I don't know. Like generally I get a lot of new students. To, there aren't too many people traveling around here that I don't already know. Oh, you know, true. It's Alberta. Why are you coming here? Um, but I can uh, imagine. For the, for the mosquitoes, man. For the Top mosquitoes. Notch. <laughs> no better. Uh, so that's you. Hey, you're the guy that is the um, the false flag. You're the guy that seems like the easy win. Uh, that's what it seems like because people come and visit. And I, 
I don't know, man. I guess they're coming to like prove themselves or something, or like I'm in the world famous academy and I'm gonna murder. I don't know. It must be a strange environment there for that reason, because it is kind of one of those destination spots for people to come train, right? Like an AOJ, uh, uh, Henzo Gracie HQ, the GBHQ, they're all up in there, right? So you must be yeah, able to see a lot of weird faces coming through. Definitely over the last year, there's been way more, way more visitors. Hmm. Way more. Like it's almost like a like a significant portion of the classes sometimes are, are like faces that I don't recognize. Is there rules against other teams coming in or people that have or might be competitors? If there are, I don't know them. Because I know that AJ has cross-trained there. I've heard stories. And um, other people before they were students, like Jake Shields and, and such, you know, they would come through. It doesn't seem like they're stopping the training for them. They're joining in, you know? Oh, yeah, definitely. Like, Jake Shields, uh, I think he, like, moved to, to New York just to train jiu-jitsu with us. Mm -hmm. Personally, I hate because if you ever train with them, it's no fun at all, man. It's like it's you learn what it's like to be a rape victim. <laughs> okay. Okay. It sucks, man. It's no fun. I'm not that's a in a strange way, it's a compliment. I guess. But uh yeah, I really like if I ever get matched up with him, I'm I know I'm in for a bad time. Okay. Yeah, I mean you just have to watch it from third person and you can tell that nobody's enjoying being completely Jake Shields from the top. Yeah. Like sometimes we'll be training. And I'm like, why am I even resisting? Why don't I just give up? Like, those are the thoughts that come through my mind. Hmm. And I never think that. <laughs> you know? I don't know. So is there anybody yeah. that has come through that, that you were, like, shock and awe? Like, I know that Hodger comes through because it's, it's Henzo, the relation there, and, and other big-name Brazilian guys. Do you, do you try to like get Browns with some of these higher up guys that come through uh, on that subject. It's, it's pretty interesting, man. There's a lot of people that are either they're like big names in jujitsu or they're big names in MMA. They're like UFC champions right. or competitors, contenders. And there's guys that are UFC champions or high level, whatever, like MMA guys. And you're like, that's your fucking jujitsu. That's how good you are. You're, yeah, I've heard that. Spot. Yeah, and then there's other guys, even guys that are trying to get into the UFC and kind of struggling to get in, where they're they're unbelievable. Hmm. So you think that's just a next generation thing, or is this just all over the map? It might even no. It could even be guys that uh, they're trying to get into the UFC and they're like losing that first or second fight, like or or that last or second to last fight that you need, that win that you need, the title defense and the local promotion that you need to get your contract. Mm -hmm. And those guys are, are unbelievable. They 100%, if they're going to do a jiu-jitsu match with someone who potentially was a champ or a former champ, they would crush them in a straight jiu-jitsu match. Hmm. So I see some of these uh, former champs, like, for instance, comes to mind is Ben Henderson. He's been doing a bunch of those submission underground matches and trying like I think he's done Metamorris as well he's he's putting his name out there um it's interesting watching them cross over because essentially it's the same thing right where everybody's trained jiu-jitsu if they're in MMA yeah. um but it's not the same thing yeah um Benson actually came we trained together okay like one time it was like two years ago or something it was but that guy can totally do submission only mm -hmm. that's one of the dudes where like like to give an example, he was playing a little, a little loose. It wasn't like I really like earned my back position, but I'm on his back and I have a rear naked and it's 99% in. And then he changes it a little so that it's only 90% in. And then it's only like 75% in and so on until he escapes like a nearly fully locked in fucking fatality from Mortal Kombat. You know what I'm yeah. saying? That's, that's some high level shit. That's what gets you through those EBI overtimes, right? Yeah, that's a great candidate for submission only. So, like, did you watch his match with Adolfo Vieira? No, where did this happen? Dude, he did a match with Adolfo Vieira in the open weight of the most recent ADCC, I think. Oh, my God. How did I not see that? I got to check that yeah. out. And, like, Adolfo, dude, it's like, it's like watching the final boss 
versus like a level one rogue or something. Like it just, it, the, the sizes of it didn't make sense, you know? Yeah. But Bando is just so tough. Like I think Adolfo eventually uh, like tapped him out with maybe an arm triangle or something, but it was like submission number 11 on Hudolfo's wow. part. Yeah. And even at, at the end of the match, Adolfo was like, dude, that was great. You know, it was like a moral victory almost. Was this the ADCC that was down in Brazil? Was this the one where Gary yeah. went against yeah. Dylan? Yeah. Okay. I think so. Because I, think, I so. think that was the last one that Hadolfo did. I remember the first guy he had, the like first seed that Hadolfo got, was uh, that big red guy, the 10th planet guy. I can't remember his, his name off the top of my head. But I remember him coming in in full spats, like had the spats and the rash guard all matching. He looks like he's in like a, a red man costume without the hood. Red and, Power Ranger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And... Um, I'm thinking, like, I'm so sorry you've got Hadolfo first shot. I can tell you're excited to be here. It's, it's great that you got here. I'm happy that you made it. But, dude, you're about to die. And he did die. It was so sad. But obvious, right? Like, that guy is so good. Yeah, it's like trying to fight a bulldozer. Uh-huh. Yeah, a bulldozer that's extremely good at choking people nearly to death. Yeah. I, I, uh, I trained with him in the gi. Oh, I'm sorry for like, you. And like, yeah, basically in like 2011 or something, it was mm -hmm. a throwback, man. It was like right when he first started winning, it was his breakout year in, uh, in Abu Dhabi. I trained with him Damn. and everyone else I was training with, it was like just rooms filled with like champions and shit. And I get to like train with these guys. Wow. And I would train with the other guys and maybe they would get the better of me. Like I would, they would go to do a guard pass and then I would defend and they would go into their next guard pass and then I would defend and they would go into the next one and they would get me on like the third move. Maybe mm -hmm. if they got something, but with Hudolfo, he'd be like, you know what? I'm going to do a cross knee pass now. And I would look at him and I'm like, Oh, okay. He's doing a cross knee pass. So I should like try to stop it. And then he would like hit the pass and that would be it. You know? And then he would go on to the next. He's like, you know what? I think I want to do neon belly. And I'm like, uh oh, Neon Belly, I should try to oh, he's got it. Like yeah. this. <laughs> it was like that, man. I like I think I think of that as that next level jujitsu. There's the jujitsu where you can keep ahead of somebody and you can you can out tech them, you can out trick them, you can juke them back and forth. And that's high level jujitsu. And then there's the next level above that where is everybody knows what you're going to do and nobody can stop it. Yeah, it's like there's a certain point when you see them doing a move, they're trying to go to neon belly and then you try to initiate a technique to stop them. But when it's Adolfo Vieira that hits neon belly, it's like, you're just trying not to shit yourself. <laughs> you know, I believe it. It's uh, I mean, I'm sure Hodger is the same way. I haven't felt his pressure, but I can imagine it would probably change my mind on a lot of life issues. Yeah. It'd make you want to quit jujitsu. Mm-hmm. I've heard that from some very, very good top pressure guys. They're like, you don't want to be under that thing. Tap early. Look what he did to Bouchesha, man. Can you believe that this guy retired from the sport as like the highest, uh, the most accolades out of anyone? Yeah. He's like, you know what? I'm going to come back. He ruins our champ current champion. It was like, yep, I'm out. Retirement. <laughs> I think that that was one of those things he had to do because of that Metamorris match, though, in Metamorris 1. They had that. That was the first time that Buchecha met him. A uh, 20 yeah. minute match ended up going to a draw. There was no submission at the end. There was no uh, judge decision at that point for that one. But apparently, um, <clears throat> and this was, I think this was leaked after the fact. Hodger didn't come out and say it himself, but he was at the tail end of fighting a bad case of staff. Like he was very, very, very sick leading into that match. Yeah. And he did a hell of a job. Like, there was a lot of back and forth against a savagely game Buchecha. And um, it's, you could tell when he came in for the second match, that was the redo. Like, he was like, this one's going to happen the way it was supposed to happen the first time. <clears throat> and he d it did. Like, um, it's exactly what I'm talking about, that guy who you know what he's going to do and he does it. Like, he got to the back, using a, a back take he's used many times before. And he choked him the fuck out first try. Yeah. Can you imagine how good you have to be to go against the guy who's the current weight, open weight champion, like the king of the sport. And then you have a draw with them and it's like, Oh, you only drew the guy. That's the number one right now. Like, yeah. 
shit, man. And then you have to like get revenge for your fucking draw <laughs> by destroying them in two minutes. That's the only way to make up for it. These are the levels is because we were talking about Buchecha at, you know, Super Saiyan God level that he is. Um, yeah. He was the Buchecha before Buchecha. And then Buchecha came in as a relative unknown and he was the antidote to Hadolfo. Hadolfo couldn't beat him. And he kept taking his titles at every event. It was Buchecha now. And uh, it's strange, like you're saying, that the guy who is the antidote, antidote to Buchecha was actually like last, last generation super champ. <laughs> yeah, it's not fair. No. No, Jiu-Jitsu sucks. Yeah, it sucks. We should all be giving up, man. <laughs> that's that's the model of the the <laughs> the day. I don't know what I'm trying to say. <clears throat> that's oh yeah. Speaking of giving up, okay, I got a match in Kasai Pro August 18th. You got to buy tickets from me if you're in New York. Good segue. <laughs> that was believable. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry, promoter. <sighs> yeah, Hollis is Hollis is going to be happy about that one. <laughs> So, before uh, we we carry on or or get closer to wrapping up, I wanted to touch back on John Callistine because <clears throat> he is a Hanzo student, correct? But he doesn't train with Danaher. Is that right? Is he with Eddie's crew? Yeah, the Wolf Pack. The Wolf Pack. Okay, I hear so little about them. For like you were saying, Eddie has almost no social media presence, so I don't really know what's going on in that edge of the dungeon. Um, He's another guy that, um, you know, I don't even know if he has a phone. John or Eddie? Both. <laughs> Is that a prerequisite? <laughs> uh, yeah. You know what, man? That might be the one thing. I've got to lose my phone. Then I'll be good at jujitsu. That must be it. That's the one secret you've been missing. Don't do that, though. I like you. I like seeing you online. Um, so about John, what has a guy got to do who is the match that's going to be that match to put him on the map that seems to be avoiding him right now um hey good question anyone the guy i think will literally fight anyone mm. like anyone 145 pounds 155 pounds 135 pounds anyone like name a fucking champion you know aj is a good one just because he's so active on the circuit mm -hmm. so uh, i thought calling him out would be the best move like he just be geo. Yeah. Nothing, nothing came of it, unfortunately. Yeah. I, I don't, I want to say, I want to see that match, but I, it really comes down to AJ. It's in his court, right? Like we were saying with notoriety, he's at an unfortunate disadvantage. John is <clears throat> in comparison to AJ. So either it has to be worth AJ's time, uh, money wise, um, I don't think he's going to get guilted into it, quite honestly. Um, or he has there no has shame. to be someone else he no shame. out so there. He's impervious to shame. So <laughs> Yeah, well, there's that. There's definitely that. Uh, who else? Maybe uh, West Coaster you can get a rivalry going with? Are there any Atos guys? Or who would it be? Marvin Castell, maybe. Ken Plano. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. I know Nikki beat him, right? Paolo Meow, Joao Meow. Hmm. Gianni Grippo. That could be interesting. Yeah, there's matches out there. So, like, I think maybe it becomes incumbent on promoters to realize that this guy's out here. And this is your time to get in early, guys. You're getting him for cheap because he's not going to be that way for a while. Yeah, 100%. I mean, the guy, this guy, he just needs more of, like, a following. He's got to release, like, a sex tape or something. <laughs> maybe John can help with that. Maybe, uh... Don Jonaher can help. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, that yeah, he's the ringer. We put Don Jonaher on it, we can make this motherfucker go viral. <laughs> now we're talking. We just need the right edit, that right shop. That'll be the day that I retire. As soon as I get a Don Jonaher post that's somehow dedicated to me, I'm done. That's my high point. That's my peak. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going above that. You should at least have it as your profile picture for the rest of your life. Please, if you ever find out who it is, I'm curious now. I might put some feelers out, see if we can uh, figure it out on the, the underwebs. It's, pro it's probably going to be the same guy who stole the Shop as a Gets username. Yeah, it's probably the same guy. Fucking guy. Uh, is there anything that you want to plug or promote? Where can people find you online? Instagram profile, Pizza Jitsu. If you're the kind of person who likes to set up seminars, 
let me know as soon as possible because I have to like set them up like uh like months in advance now. My seminars are amazing. Five I've stars. heard that. I've heard that. Like not even shitting. I've heard a lot of people talk highly. Well, I mean, I mentioned it before, but who is actually studying? Like, how is it that you make people better as best as possible within a two to three hour time frame? Mm-hmm. Like, it's just, it's not, it's not an art that anyone even knows that they should be trying to master. But, uh, whatever, I guess I have like some, some matches coming up and doing Puerto Vida Invitational Amen EBI tournament in, uh, in Costa Rica. That's August 1st. And then two days later, I do a seminar and then I fly back. And I do fight to win August 3rd in Asbury Park, New Jersey. And then two weeks later, I do Kasai Invitational or Kasai Pro or whatever it is, uh-huh. August 18th. All fucking different weights for all of these. I need to nail that down yeah. for you so you can stop having to eat sadness. Right, man? I just need matches, man. I don't even care. And then uh, I think I'm going to do high rollers. That's like in September sometime. Okay, that's uh, West Coast. That's Jeff Glover's. I have no idea. I guess he did the tournament, but you know, you have to like smoke weed before you compete. Is that a like a prerequisite? You have to have yeah, to? Yeah, dude. You don't know? You haven't seen this tournament? Well, I've seen the clips of them doing it. I didn't know that it was like you have to. You can't roll unless you do. I think you have to, man. If you want to be cool. That's almost interesting to me. Like, I wonder if that changes some people's games, you know? You might see some weird shit come up. Yeah, it's definitely like I think it solves that uh, the problem that Gordon talked about, where mm-hmm. you got to make moves and be interesting. <laughs> hey, I'll I'll watch the stream next time. How about that? Especially if you're on it. When is that happening? I think it's September twenty eighth. It's like not one hundred percent confirmed, but it looks good. I think I'm pretty sure I'm going to be on it. Cool. All right, guys. Uh, thanks a lot for me. coming on, Quinn. It's been a ton of fun. And uh, anybody wants to hit him up, get him on Pizza Jitsu and uh, tell him his mustache is sexy. Damn, has it been an hour and 45 minutes? Yeah, it has, man. It's been good times. Took up my whole Wednesday night, man. (laughs) I'm sure you usually got big Wednesday plans, though, right? All right, good talking to you, Drew. Yeah, my pleasure. We'll take care. See you next time on Yumi and Us.